This year has been an amazing year. I'm so grateful, so grateful for the year that that we've had, and um, so grateful for the friends I've made this year. And, and just thinking back, but all the all the games I got to play this year. You know, I, I worked really, really hard, really hard this year. Probably I worked harder this year than any year that I can remember. And. You know, just thinking back about the, carving out that time, that that peace and quiet to be able to sit down and play some games and, you know, work hard during the day and carve out an hour here, an hour there to be able to sit down and totally enjoy a hobby like video games. Make sure that you're not shirking your family responsibilities and making sure you're spending time with your kids and all of those things. So I... I'm very fortunate this year. I got to play a lot of really great games, and I was just thinking back about all the games that I I completed this year. And wow, I managed to complete a lot of games in 2023. Hi, buddy. He's running all over the place here on the beach. And I think you know, starting off at the beginning of the year really grateful that I got to play with my son. We both got to really enjoy playing uh, Fire Emblem Engage. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun to be able to sit, introduce a whole new franchise to my son and I. I I'd never played any Fire Emblem games. And uh, so we both you know, went to the mall that day, picked up Fire Emblem Engage. I'd never played one, he'd never played it. I picked up the special edition. <laughs> He's like, what is this game, Daddy? I'm like, I don't know. It looks like a great RPG. I've heard great things about it. Let's give it a shot. And that was kind of the beginning of the year at the you know, beginning of January. After the Christmas doldrums, you know, after everything kind of settles down. January is always like the worst, worst month in my opinion, you know. So we dove into Fire Emblem Engage and it started off a little slow for us, I think. And we each kind of went at our own pace. After though the first few chapters, we were sold. And we were absolutely in it, totally enjoying the game. The combat was just beautiful. I, I really, I love the art style. I know there was a lot of people kind of slamming the art style and the, the blue and red hair. That's fine. But for me, I thought it was great. I love the colors. I love the characters. I thought they were all so interesting. I love the interplay between them. And I love the strategy. I found it to be difficult. I mean, it was in a, in a fun way, you know, really strategizing the battlefield, and thinking about where I'm gonna move my, my, my guys on the battlefield. Do I wanna group them together? Do I wanna separate them? You know, do I wanna attack line up some some spells first some, you know launch some magic first to be able to protect myself or uh, you know add extra extra layers of defense before I go in for an attack do I want to remotely attack from a distance you know all of those things and I really like the story I know people thought the story was a little shallow fine you know as long as it's allowing me that breath to uh, have some space with all the work that I had been doing I thought this was a great uh, this was a great escape for me and the battles took a long time I mean there was plenty of battles where I was in it for 30 minutes 40 minutes and then I lost I lost the battle I had to restart the whole thing go back rethink my strategy and I love that. Even going back to my, you know, playing Warcraft and back to my Firefly Studios playing Stronghold days on the PC. Uh, there'd be times where I'd be 40 minutes into a battle with archers and catapults attacking my castle. 
and I did something stupid or I just didn't do it properly and I would have to redo, go back and re redo the whole battle. But there were so many side quests in this game. There were so many things to look at. Go off and do uh, different scrimmages uh, with, you know, with individuals. Build up your, uh, level up your characters. There was a lot to do with the Som uh, Somniel, which was the main sort of hub. The music was great. It was cold outside. It was just a magical game. So my son finished it actually before I did. And he was, he loved it, absolutely loved it. And was so enthralled with the story. And it was really a, a kind of a, it was a great father and son experience to be able to come together on this game. So I finished it a few weeks later. Uh, and, you know, again, like I said, really enjoyed it. I didn't play the DLC. There was a really, it was supposed to be a really great DLC that came out. I never, I never got to playing the DLC just the main 26 chapters and a bunch of the side quests and scrimmages. But it's one of those games I'd like to go back and revisit and play the DLC and maybe finish some of the side quests. I learned something about myself this year. I learned, I really learned this year that I'm kind of a completionist. I, I really love kind of trying to 100% some games. And I love going after all of the side quests. A game that I'm right now working on and trying to finish before the end of the year is Tears of the Kingdom. Of course, I got it the day it came out. We started playing it immediately. And of course, one of the, you know, unbelievable game. I think one of the greatest games I've ever played. Maybe the greatest game ever made, in my opinion. And I've just picked it up again after beating a whole bunch of other games. And I, I'm, I'm almost at the end. I've just gotten the fifth Sage. But I'm doing all, I'm trying to complete all of the shrines. So I have about 145 shrines. There's 152 shrines right now in Tears of the Kingdom. I've done all of the light routes in the depths. Uh, I have about eight side quests to finish. And I think I want to finish, first of all, all the shrines. And then I think I want to tackle all of the side quests and then finish the game. I know, I know. And there's probably side quests I haven't even discovered. I'm just talking about the ones that I've uncovered. There's probably more. And it's funny, I was completing one the other day and suddenly a new one popped up. And I said, no, there's another one. But I don't mind it. I'm really enjoying the game. And I, I think I'm just enjoying the journey of it. I'm in, like in no rush to finish it. Um, and I just, I've really been enjoying every moment of this game. So... I've really learned that about myself this year, that I'm kind of a completionist when it comes to, to certain games. Others, I don't need to complete them, but this one I really, there's certain ones that I really want to collect everything and do as much as I can. Um, I did that with Spider-Man 2. So Spider-Man 2 is a game that I, I completed every side quest. There's still a few things I have to finish with some of the aerial moves in order to get, uh, unlock those final trophies to get the platinum. But uh, really loved playing Spider-Man 2. Oh, I gotta cross this river here. Come on, buddy. Let's Spider-Man 2 this. Let's climb across this. If I had webbing, this would be a lot easier. Climbing up this cliff over here during our morning walk. Just beautiful out. So yeah, I was talking about Spider-Man 2 and that's a game I completed. I didn't platinum it yet. It's still on my list to platinum. In fact, I think this will be the first game I ever platinum on the PlayStation 5. Completing everything. I did all the side quests. I did the Mysteriums, all of the, all of the drone birds, every side quest possible. The only thing I haven't completed yet is I understand when you're doing the webbing, when you're swinging through the city, you can do different flips and things like that. And by doing a series of flips, you unlock a different trophy. And there's a couple of like those types of trophies that I need to unlock uh, in order to, uh, to get that platinum. So I'm gonna do that. My son, Miles, said that he thinks Spider-Man 2 is his favorite game ever made. It's hard to argue with that. It's an amazing game. 
I love the story. Growing up, of course, a huge Spider-Man fan. That was my first love, Amazing Spider-Man. Then later became a Batman fan as well, but Spider-Man always has a soft spot for me as just the greatest. And I, you know, it's so relatable as a teenager. And I thought this storyline was so relatable. You know, wanting to go off to college. And I thought the interplay between Miles Morales and Peter Parker was, was well done. A little out of breath coming up this cliff. I thought the interplay was great. It wasn't overdone. And it was great that you could switch between the characters. It's going to be interesting to see. I'm not to give you any spoilers, but we know they're obviously planning Spider-Man 3. That's not a shock at all. You know, so what are they going to do? What are they going to do with Spider-Man 3? Will it just be a Miles? Miles Morales game, you know, Miles Morales 2. But we know they're, you know, I'm a Peter Parker fan, you know, I've always been. I, I like Miles Morales just fine, but for me, for me, I'm happy to just have a straight up Peter Parker storyline. Just give me Peter Parker. Have a separate, separate Miles Morales game. Have a few scenes where they come together in each of these games, but allow it to be a Peter Parker game, you know? What's wrong with that? <laughs> um, allow it to be a Miles Morales game. And maybe if Peter wants to show up for a scene or two, great. But I think, you know, leave it up be a Miles Morales game and have that be its own experience. I don't know that you need to switch between these two characters in every Spider-Man game going forward. That's just my opinion, you know, I think. It was great though. I really liked, I loved what they did with this. I thought it was great, the interplay between them. I thought the MJ part of it was really great. I really enjoyed the stealth missions with her. I thought that was a lot of fun. I thought that was really a lot of fun. I loved, and she was pretty strong too. And they didn't make her overly strong. Like she's, you know, she's got some superpower. Well, I won't spoil anything in the game, of course, but you know, being able to use the taser, being able to use the web shooter at one point, being able to sneak up on people. It had it had Resident Evil, had Resident Evil 4 vibes to me. So I, I definitely enjoyed I enjoyed that part of the game. I mean, and the Venom stuff was just off the charts. And I'm not the greatest like Venom fan in the world. I was always a bigger fan of Dr. Octopus and the Green Goblin and Sandman. Sandman was always my favorite character, always my favorite villain. So I really loved the opening cinematics of this game. Um, playing, playing sand, playing, you know, against Sandman and some of these other villains, but the Sandman stuff was whew, unbelievable. Maybe the greatest opening to any game I've ever played, just off the charts. But yeah, I completed Spider-Man 2. What a game that was. And again, that's a game I'm gonna continue to play. We know now from Sony that there's gonna be a big update to Spider-Man 2 later this year. So we'll see New Game Plus, some sort of a DLC, something. And I'm excited about that. Let me know, what do you guys think about, do you guys like getting DLCs right away or New Game Plus right away? I, I've heard some people say they, they would love it to have, you know, right away. Like they wanna get those things immediately with the game coming out. And I don't want that. You know, I've, it's been, I, I don't mind coming back to a game like Tears of the Kingdom right now, you know? I haven't finished it. And it was kind of fun, I came back and I had to kind of relearn some of the mechanics again, Ultra Hand and all of that stuff. But you know, it's like riding a bike after a, after a few hours of, or you know, like an hour of gameplay, you're kind of back in it again. Oh yeah, how do I fuse these things? How do I bring, and I don't mind it after a few months, be able to come back with a new extended storyline is great. So I, I'm, this new game plus stuff, I'm okay with it being spaced out. And, and I'm enjoying that, you know. So, yeah, I'd love to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, so Fire Emblem Engage, Spider-Man 2, Tears of the Kingdom, I'm almost done with. I'll finish it here before the end of the year, so that'll go on my completed list. Panorama's up here, just beautiful. Up above this cliff here. Take a look at this. Grover loves it. 
wonder how a dog knows. I guess the same way a human knows, right? To not climb, jump off a cliff. <laughs> but if those rocks give way, be careful, buddy. Look, he's like, okay. Just take it easy over there. <laughs> I think, you know, getting that morning walk-in, I, I noticed it for myself, getting that morning walk-in is so important because then the anxiety goes away for my day. Like first thing in the morning, having a nice long walk. Then this sort of anxiety and thinking about work and all of that stuff kind of disappears once I get that nice morning exercise. One thing I just thought about was Tears of the Kingdom this year was, I, f I wanted to mention this, I took my kids to a summer camp uh, and uh, I, I, it was up in Scotland. And my wife's like, you know, you just got to stay there with them because, you know, she's nervous, like kids at a camp and you're in a different area, whatever. So I did. I rented like a little Airbnb place and took some time off work, just brought brought some books to read and I brought Tears of the Kingdom. That's it. And I brought my switch dock, plugged it into the TV and wake up in the morning and take a nice long walk, go get some breakfast get a nice English breakfast, sausage and beans and eggs and all that. Take a, take a walk back and settle down by the fireplace. And you know, even in the summer, Scotland can be cold. And then I just sat in the afternoon and for a few hours, just played Tears of the Kingdom. Just took time off work, time away from thinking about everything. And it was just so great to be able to sit there and play that game. I spent so much time in the depths for that time period. It was going through, trying to get as many light routes as I could. I became like the king of the depths. <laughs> I ended up building a, a flying like motorcycle to fly all around the depths. And it's so funny, the way I built it, and I never fixed it. It was slightly askew, like it leans to the left. So when you take off, it slightly leans to the left because it's not perfectly centered. And I just got used to it, but I never rebuilt it because it was in my auto build. So I just kept reusing this like leaning to the left motorcycle <laughs> for the whole time in the depths. Sometimes when I would take off, I'd crash right into something, but it was so funny. I just, it became like my, uh, became like my baby, even though it was like slightly askew and I would take off and crash. I didn't care. And still to this day, that's the one I use, even when I'm in the, uh, in Hyrule, in the upper world, I'll still make that, I'll still use the same one. I just gotta make sure I have enough clearance when I'm taken off. That way I don't, uh, I don't crash into somebody or crash into a wall or something like that. Oh, the surfers are out today. A lot of surfers out today. Another good thing about getting out first thing in the morning is all that sunlight the vitamin D, you know, ask any doctor that knows anything, the power of like waking up and going out first thing in the morning. I read a sleep book recently. So one of the most important things you can do after a good night's sleep is to go out and get some sunlight first thing. Really helps ground you. So all that vitamin D really sets the tone for the day and so nice. And in fact, my sister-in-law is a big proponent of going outside, getting vitamin D, taking your shoes off and just putting your feet in the grass, grounding yourself. Another game I completed this year is a game called Dredge. And, you know, I have a lot of games to play. I don't know why this one spoke to me. Um, I talked about it in another video where I did a kind of a deep dive on my thoughts on Dredge. I really, really loved this game. You're a fishing, you're a fishing boat captain, a dredging boat captain who has to go around and dredge up secrets. I guess being by the ocean, it made me think of it right now. I told the story of how growing up, my dad and I would go down to the Chesapeake Bay, go crabbing, go fishing. First thing in the morning, we'd leave from Pennsylvania at like f four in the morning and go down. And so I would have a soft spot for like being out on the water in a small boat, small fishing boat. And story is, I really enjoyed the story. I didn't 100% it, but I certainly completed it. And I just had a blast with it. It's really, it's really interesting. You, you Basically, it's like a, a fishing RPG where you're leveling up your ship, you're dredging up secrets from the depths. Very like Lovecraftian 
monsters that appear at nighttime. If you're out at past dark, you know, it can be very, very uh, difficult to find your way around. The fog sets in. There's all these mysterious stories with the, the lighthouse and the lighthouse keeper and the fishmonger and, and all of these things. And it's, it's really creepy. And the story is really interesting. And wh why did the former fishing captain disappear? And you're pulling things up out of the ocean from like a hundred years ago, mysteries and secrets, messages in a bottle and stuff like that. And anyway, I had a lot of fun with this game and it's not for everybody, but I, I, I really enjoyed it. I love the fishing mechanic as well. You know, the fishing mechanic, having to, to, to put your fishing, fishing rod in the water and pull up different things reminds me now that I've played Alan Wake, which is another game I just completed. The first one, the first Alan Wake. The the turning on of the diesel generators and lights is similar to the fishing mechanic in Dredge, where this like sort of spinny dial goes around, and you've got to you've got to time it just right in order to pull the fish out of the water. Yeah, and you know, I thought I thought the different islands that you would go to in this game were interesting. The different the different places you could sell your fish and all of that was really interesting. The di talking to the different the different villagers and the interplay between all of them was was really fascinating and I, I had a yeah I had a really good time with that they're doing a lot of construction down here along the beach they're fixing this sidewalk and boardwalk because after the season is done now now that we're now we're in December we'll fix everything for next season All the painting. I can't imagine trying to maintain stuff by a beach like this. All the painting and everything you have to do. Rusting in a way. Dealing with seawater. Like this pool over here. This hotel pool behind me here that they've got to maintain. They're constantly painting that thing. It's kind of crazy. Like every season I see them painting it. Just to finish my thoughts on Dredge, you know, playing it during the Halloween season made it extra creepy. And yeah, I just love the ambiance of it. I love the music. I love the art style. Uh, and uh, I didn't get to play the DLC. They just released a DLC. And I'm gonna go back and jump into that as well. I would love to see them do some sort of, sort of a, a crossover. You know, how we have like a Dead Cells Castlevania crossover. I, they could really do something fun with like a dredge crossover. I, I can't, I don't know. Let me know in the comments below what you think. What would be like a good crossover game for dredge? But uh, I think there's plenty of other like Lovecraftian games out there that it could, there could be something interesting there. I, I don't know. I'll have to think more about that. Yeah, jump, jump. Leave that guy alone. He loves to like run after other people that are running. Sometimes they're really nice, and other times they yell at me, and then I yell back at them because they get scared of a tiny little dog. They're wimps. They're wimps. Up here on this cliffside, when we come down here for dinner. Sometimes the kids, you go up these these stairs here, it goes all the way up this cliff. There's dinosaur bones, dinosaur fossils uh, in the cliff wall here. Uh, I'm not gonna go up there today. I've already walked three miles. So I'm not going up, I'm not going up these stairs. Maybe another video, I'll show them to you at the top. It goes all the way up to, uh, goes all the way up to a lighthouse up there. It's beautiful, but this is my like halfway point to kind of come down here and love to touch this wall and then turn around and go back home. Big jellyfish. Huge jellyfish. Holy smokes, this one's a big one. Look at this. Careful, buddy. After the kids go to school, he starts bugging me to take him on a walk. He just keeps coming up and barking at me. So. I have to go out, but then he'll sleep the rest of the day. 
you know, we'll walk five, six miles, and then he's passed out the rest of the day. It's such good exercise for him. And it removes the anxiety from my life. So it's a good combo. It's a good combo. Incoming, incoming. He's like a speed demon, speed demon. You know, speaking of Halloween time, I have to say one of the, my favorite games of the year that I completed had just an absolute blast playing is Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Of course, big shout out to my friend John over at the Happy Console Gamer who told me, Clayton, you've got to play this game this Halloween. You've never played it. You've got to play this game. And I did a whole deep dive video on it. You should go check it out. But boy, what an unbelievable game. And I, in that video, I noticed in the comment threads, a lot of you said, wow, I forgot about this game. I'm gonna go back and play it. Uh, I'm gonna play it. I'm gonna play it for the first time. I didn't realize it was this good. Yeah, the music, the, and of course the term Castle uh, Metroidvania really comes from this game. Uh, this back and forth, decision to go back and forth, back and forth, and seek out this castle using a Metroid style in a Castlevania setting, Metroidvania was born. It really was, even though the term Metroidvania from my research is still misty and murky, like where it comes from, but it really is, I think the consensus is that this game gave rise to that terminology. And the music is second to none. I still think about the music all the time. And just a beautiful experience playing this game. Uh, I loved I loved the story. I loved the, the cheesy voice acting. I loved the graphics. I loved the, the leveling up, getting different swords, different shields, different uh, spells that you could cast. I love the enemies. The enemies were so creative. I love the creepy mannequin, you know, enemies and, and all of that. Uh, it, it was, and I, you know, I had also, my son and I had just beat the first Castlevania a few weeks earlier. So I never finished the first Castlevania until this year. And, and my son, of course, never played it when he, he's 13. So he never knew. So we played the first Castlevania, completed that, and then a few weeks later, uh, started playing uh, started playing Symphony of the Night. Of course, Spider-Man 2 came out right at the same time, so my son went off and he's like, all right, I gotta, I'm gotta. i putting down Castlevania Symphony of the Night. He's, he went full into Spider-Man 2, and I totally get that. I waited on Spider-Man 2 until I finished Symphony of the Night, and there were so many nights where it was pouring down rain, and I was playing in my, my game room, and it, the rain was hitting the windows and it was so dark and kind of dreary and the wind was howling outside and here I am playing Castlevania Symphony of the Night and completing that game you know getting halfway through the game and thinking that you're you're done you know no spoilers but it was such an unbelievable thing to see that no you're not done <laughs> you think you're done you're not done and then of course not giving anything away if you've never played this game, go and play it. But that was another game that I completed this year in 2023, and I'm thrilled that I did. I've, I'm thrilled that I got to beat the original Castlevania, which is one of the hardest games I've ever played, and then beat Castlevania Symphony of the Night. That was a cool, cool Castlevania time in 2023, that's for sure. I have to say one game keeps standing out to me as one of my favorite games of the year, and that is Resident Evil 4, the remake the remaster, whatever you want to call it. I guess it is a remake, really. Uh, and wow. I'd never played a Resident Evil game before. No, well, that's not true. I played a little bit of, I think, Resident Evil 1 when it first came out, uh, but I didn't own it. So I played it on a friend's, uh, friend's, friend's console. So I never, played, I never played through a Resident Evil game before. So I started with Resident Evil 4, the remake. Now the standard is set, right? But I couldn't put this game down. I had to go and do other things. I had to get back to work. And I just wanted to keep going on to the next chapter, to the next chapter, to the next chapter. The pacing, the combat. I love that you could catch your breath and find a typewriter 
right? Just take a break for a moment uh, and, and talk, with the, talk with the shopkeeper, you know, to, to buy some things. Take a breath by the typewriter and, oh, okay, I'm safe for a second. I'm in this room, nothing's gonna hurt me. I'm safe, okay. And then, all right, I'm going back to it. I've reloaded, I've restocked. Let me get back out there. And at every turn, I was just creeped out and jump scared. And the settings, whether you're, when you go into the dungeons, oh my gosh, when you're in the castle dungeons, talk about, talk about being scared out of my mind. You know, I just recently, for a gift, my sister, um, she she doesn't have a console and so for her birthday I said okay we're gonna do this and I got her a PS5 for her birthday and she loves horror horror movies and everything and I and I told her I said a few weeks before that I said you, know, you should consider playing some video games there's so many uh, you know survival horror games that I think you would really like that instead of sitting down at the end of the night and putting on Netflix and just watching some you know some horror movie what if you were interacting with a horror movie you know and she loves like really gruesome stuff you know like cabin in the woods kind of stuff and all that and so yeah I hooked her up with uh with it and then I uh I told her she's got to get so she she got Resident Evil 4 she asked for it for Christmas so she's waiting on that and I told her she's got to get Alan Wake which is another game I just completed you know Alan Wake 2 is out now and everyone's raving about it but I never played Alan Wake 1 so I picked it up for really cheap uh the PlayStation 4 version of it I I think they give you an upgrade for the PlayStation 5 but I don't think there's a PlayStation 5 disc from what I can tell trying to order it on Amazon, I can't find the PlayStation 5 version of Alan Wake. They'll give you an upgrade. When you buy the PlayStation 4, it'll give you a PS5 upgrade, but let me know in the comments. I, I can't find it. If there is one, I can't find it. Anyway, I bought the PS4 version and got the PS5 upgrade. Right, here we go. And I loved it's Alan Wake. I time. hated the combat. I hated is a strong word, but I really didn't like the combat. Oh. The story I loved. And I was properly creeped out. I had so many jump scares during this game. A lot of it, and it's sad because, you know, to me, Resident Evil 4, the combat is amazing. And then you play Alan Wake a few weeks later and you're like, oh my God, the combat kind of sucks. I'm using a flashlight. And then I'm, I'm shooting these guys in the face and it's taking me like seven bullets, six bullets or more to kill these guys. And in Resident Evil, I'm killing them in three shots. Like, what's going on here, you know? And I'm having to reload. It just, it felt like the combat was a little forced where I don't like that jankiness of the, the flashlight having to freeze them a little bit. You know, they don't like the light. They're, they, they thrive in the darkness. And then I can shoot them. And when I shoot them five, six times, they're still not dead or they're, it takes me all these bullets to kill these guys. So I didn't like, I thought the, the bad guys in this were unnecessarily difficult when you compare it to like a Resident Evil 4 combat. But the storyline in Alan Wake is, oh, fantastic. If you love thrillers, if you love mystery novels. So I, I've heard they, I ha, I've heard Alan Wake 2, they've really done some great things to make the combat experience better. I think they've listened to the feedback. I don't know, I haven't played it yet. But just kind of comparing the two, they kind of sit near to me in a, you know, in you're following sort of a linear path through, through Resident Evil and you're not doing Metroidvania style back and forth. And I have to say, I really like that. I like Metroidvania style games, hunting around for it, but I really do like the linear, keep me on a path, okay? Let me finish this game. You know, I'm 46 years old. I've got a lot going on in my life. I don't need to be hunting around for a cave, you know? I don't need to spend three hours looking for a cave. Just let me find, <laughs> let me find the cave, you know? <clears throat> Still getting over this pneumonia that I had. And that's the way Alan Wake is, you know? You're not, 
you can go off the beaten path a little bit and find some things in the woods, but it's keeping you on the rails. And I appreciate that. Get, take me through this story. And I was done in about 20 hours. I think I put about 20 hours into Alan Wake and finished that. I have to go back and look at how many hours I spent on Resident Evil 4. But I, and by the way, I bought the DLC for Resident Evil 4. Um, and I haven't, I haven't done that just yet. I haven't played it. I've heard great things about it. And I, I've heard it's about a 15 hour, like 10 to 15 hour DLC. Um, so I haven't done that yet, but I'm really looking forward to that. That's a game I'll probably come back to. I know I'll come back to it. I bought the DLC. I'm going to come back to that. To me, that's one of the greatest games I've ever played. Resident Evil 4 was amazing. So if you're into if you're into horror games, you're into that first person shooter style, you're into being scared out of your mind, you're into great combat. And there's also something beautiful about your suitcase that you're carrying with all of your weapons and lining things up properly, making sure that things can fit in your in your suitcase, your your backpack, whatever you want to call it. I really appreciated that as well. And that's one thing about Alan Wake. It's like, why do you have to keep taking away my weapons every level? <laughs> you know, like, I just got a shotgun. I just got a stronger flashlight. Okay, I've passed this chapter. Why do I not have it now? Now I'm back to having nothing? Or I'm now I'm back to just having a handgun again? What the hell's going on here? Why are you taking it away from me every level? But I guess that's part of the intrigue of it. You know, you're not really, you're not really sure what's going on. You're not really sure if you're in a dream state or you're in reality. What's happening? Where's your wife? Um, I really, really enjoyed that. So if you can get past the combat part of it, the storyline is fantastic. I, I highly recommend playing Alan Wake. And I'm now I'm more excited to play Alan Wake 2 with all of the awards and all of the praise that Alan Wake 2 has gotten. I'm, I'm excited about that. All right, buddy, it's time to head back home here. I'm just kind of at the halfway point, just taking a little break. I hadn't really taken a walk much this week. Eh, I did maybe two this week. Normally I do them pretty much every day. But uh, my son's been home from school sick. He's had pneumonia. So like childhood pneumonia has been going around pretty bad. So I just kind of stayed with him and didn't really take a long walk in the morning like I usually do. Uh, and he finished uh, he finished and beat Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy 1 on the Pixel Remaster. So let's talk about that. So my son and I took a flight recently and I bought him as a gift for the for his uh, for his birthday uh, Final Fantasy the Pixel Remasters and I bought a copy for myself. And I'm really excited about this collection. I played Final Fantasy 1, of course, back in the day on the Nintendo, on the on the NES, and I really didn't remember it, you know, and he certainly didn't play it. I've been trying to introduce him to a lot of these classic games, uh, and we started playing it together, and what I loved about the Pixel Remasters, first of all, is you can swap between the different soundtracks, the original and the new uh, fully orchestrated sound, and my son loves figuring out soundtracks he'll he'll we'll go to a movie he'll come home and play on the piano you know Hans Zimmer scores and things like that and so he loves soundtracks he loves movie soundtracks and I think I think he might actually become like a movie score composer you know that's how much he loves it and so he had a blast just playing the game of course but really like flipping through between all of the different pixel like the the orchestration the behind like back and forth of the orchestration the original and the new fully orchestrated version and he was tapping his fingers to it and like figuring it out and he it was it was great to put on headphones and to hear the original and then to hear this full beautiful orchestration they did an amazing job bringing in a full orchestra to do the whole soundtrack again but i had a blast going back through this game again and what's great about the Pixel Remasters is it modernizes it in a way and it makes it more enjoyable for you to level up more quickly. So you can go into, you can go into the boost section and you can, 
you, you can double the amount of experience you get. You can, you can quadruple the amount of money and, and experience you get, whatever your choice is. So for the first, I would say 10 levels, my son and I just did on the normal level. We didn't, we didn't boost the experience. We didn't boost any of it. We went through a lot of the story without that turned on, you know, the original way. And uh, again, it was funny. I was listening to the soundtrack in the original version and my son was doing the fully orchestrated version. So it was kind of funny, modern versus old, you know? Um, and, uh, but, and then we turned on the doubling of experience and getting more gill, getting more money. And it just really helped out a lot because, you know, I have so many games I want to get through. I don't want to spend weeks and weeks and weeks grinding. Uh, and so, and also I think for a modern, for a modern experience for my son, it just made, it sped up the gameplay a little bit. We've got a lot of Final Fantasy games to get through, you know, this is his first one. We've got 16 to get through. So, but we both completed it. He was home from school with pneumonia this week and he finally finished it. I finished it a few weeks ago. So that's another game that we completed this year. Final Fantasy one on the Pixel Remasters. Highly recommend that collection if you haven't picked it up. It's got Final Fantasy one through six on there on one cartridge, which is fantastic, you know, to be able to, and have that modern experience with being able to double up and even quadruple the, the experience and money. How many of you guys have played the Pixel Remasters? It's a, it's a great collection, it really is. I always like it when another dog is here, so he runs like crazy with these other dogs for a while. It's like extra exercise for him. Last week I finished Super Mario RPG. Now here's a game I never owned a Super Nintendo. And that's actually one of the things I'm excited about over the next year to two years is being able to dive into more Super Nintendo games. I've got the Analog ST, which is the Super Nintendo version, and I'm working on getting an actual Super Nintendo just because I'm crazy, and I think it'd be a lot of fun. I went right from the Atari to the, to the, the NES, and then from the NES to the Sega Genesis, and then the PlayStation 1. So I missed the Super Nintendo and so many great games on that system. I stopped the video for a second because I thought it got too windy and then I listened back to it and the audio was fine actually. This iPhone 15 Pro is actually, has a really good wind, wind reduction. And I'm up here on a cliff side with the wind is kind of whipping a little bit. I have some microphones that I ordered specifically. So it's not gonna just be the phone when I do these videos from now on, but but yeah, I thought it was gonna suck and I listened back and it's 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 fine. It's not bad. Maybe a little wind here and there, but not too bad. Anyway, I was talking about the Super Nintendo. At the end of its life cycle, the Super Nintendo, of course, Super Mario RPG came out. And uh, I never played this game. I'm a huge role-playing game fan, huge RPG fan. So yes, I picked it up. And boy, <laughs> did I absolutely love it. I could see how this game was a great entry point for people to fall in love with role-playing games for the first time. I mean, oh, the, the, the combat. Yeah, it's not overly complex in any kind of way, but making decisions can, you know, you, okay, am I gonna use some magic here? Am I going to raise my defense for my team here first? Um, you know, all of that before I, before I go into this battle. Uh, when I'm taking on some of these, uh, you know, more difficult guys, you know, am I going to use Princess Peach to cast, cast some protection and also make sure that they're, he you know, she's continuing to heal them so that they can continue to stay in this battle? Like all of that was a lot of fun. And of course the graphics and the, the sense of humor, the sense of humor in this game. I, I was laughing. I was laughing out loud a bunch of times. The sarcasm, the sense of humor, the interplay. I loved the Bowser interactions where you're part of a team with Bowser and 
you have to pretend that you're his minion, his underling in order to be on his team. I thought that was just brilliant. I had so much fun with this game. I thought, what a what a classic. And I think the comparing the graphics and the updates that they made to the new Nintendo Switch version to the classic, they made some great on-screen updates to let you know uh, how close you are to filling up your gauge again to get to 100% when you can use some of your special moves. There's definitely some uh, nice, really nice uh, quality of life enhancements, uh, but a lot of the a lot of the original feeling and tempo of this game apparently is still there. So I'm excited to go back and play the original version now that I've completed it. But oh boy, just had a lot of fun with Super Mario RPG. So I just finished that game, uh, and another Super Mario game that I had a chance to play this year was Super Mario Wonder. So two Super Mario games I completed this year. I did a whole deep dive on Super Mario Wonder. I've done a couple of videos on it. My five most difficult levels video, you know, for a lot of it, it was pretty easy. The game was fairly easy, but there was a lot of levels that I found incredibly difficult. Uh, but that's another game I completed this year, Super Mario Wonder. Uh, I thought it was a masterpiece, honestly. I think it was probably the greatest Super Mario game ever made, in my opinion. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, but I think as a platformer, the design, everything, every level was just made with such precision and beauty and thought uh, and whimsy. It's like you just, it's like letting kids run free in a candy store to come up with ideas for this game. And that's exactly what I thought Super Mario Wonder was like. It was just, you gave these artists, these designers, like car, just an empty canvas to come up with some amazing gameplay and I thought it, it, that was the experience I love the music I love the upgrades that you could make with you know uh, turning into an elephant and turning into a uh, you know a, a, a drilling machine and all of these other things really loved my Super Mario experiences in 2023 and then of course we had the Super Mario movie which the kids loved and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it you know it was a it was fun. So it was definitely a year of Mario, that's for sure, in a lot of ways. Now, did we get a brand new 3D Mario? No. We didn't get a Super Mario Odyssey Part 2 or the second version of that. But I think that's going to come out with the Nintendo Switch 2. i got to think that with the launch of that next system, you'll see a new Super Mario Brothers Odyssey, a new 3D Super Mario Brothers. That's my thought anyway. Because that was certainly a launch game, you know, Super Mario Odyssey and Breath of the Wild were very early on in that system. So I think we'll see it, but I'm very happy with the 2D platform um, with this game. I, I had a lot of fun. I thought it was brilliant. I, I didn't 100% it. I need to go back and still get a few Wonder Seeds here and there. And if I want to go back and play it, I still want to get some of the standees. I didn't get all the standees either. I got a lot of them, like 80 of them. So at some point I'll go back to that. But yeah, two Super Mario Brothers games that I completed this year and had a lot of fun doing it. Being up here in the sandy conditions and the, I don't know, like the bamboo and the prairie, it kind of feels like the prairie of uh, Red Dead Redemption a little bit. Nah, not quite. <laughs> There's no ocean. There's no ocean, but that's another game that I completed this year, Red Dead Redemption on the Nintendo Switch. So here's a game I never, I never, actually that's not true. I played a little bit of it. Uh, was it on the PS4 that I played a little bit of it back in the day? Uh, very little. I mean, maybe less than an hour of it. And again, there was a huge black hole for me of game playing where I was too focused on my career, too focused on working. And so I just didn't make space for it. And so I played for a little bit and then got distracted, you know, um, with uh, with other things. So, so uh, yeah, I never played it. But anyway, I picked it up on the Nintendo Switch. And we were traveling this summer. And it came out while we were traveling. So I bought the digital, I bought the digital version of it, downloaded it at a hotel. And we were about to get on this bus. And I was like, no, no, it's, and it wasn't finished downloading yet. I was like, please finish, please finish. And, uh, and it barely finished right as I was getting on the bus. So I got to play Red Dead Redemption on this whole trip. And wow, I did a whole video on what I think about Red Dead Redemption. I'll 
I'll link it up if you want to go check it out. But what an amazing game. I thought it was a near perfect game in my experience and absolutely love the open world ambiance of driving around, you know, riding your horse all through the West. I grew up loving Western movies. I love Western culture. I love the idea of being an out with the mountains and the prairies and all of that. You know, it's funny, in fact, I I think that's why I love taking walks just out in the middle of nothing. Uh, but I just love that sort of Western vibe. I had an idea, I told my wife this a couple of times, and it's, I would love to open like a Western town where you go and you have to like relinquish your cell phones. You cannot have any technology whatsoever. I guess kind of like Westworld. Now, it's funny, I had this idea long before that, that show ever came out on HBO. But the idea that you would go to a Western town that's like set in the 1870s, you know, like a Deadwood, South Dakota kind of thing. And I uh, hope it's not too windy. Uh, get to a less windy spot. And so you would go to like this, you know, Deadwood, South Dakota kind of place. And you would, you know, you would, uh, you would check into a hotel and it'd be like a saloon. Now, I'm not saying there'd be like a brothel or anything like that. But I'm saying there'd be like a saloon, there'd be a, a person playing the saloon piano, you know, you could go up and get a whiskey, but there's no cell phones allowed, there's no technology, you can't bring a laptop, you can't even bring, you know, maybe they even give you like a, they'll have a, they'll have somebody set up like a, a, a camera, like they would in the Civil War, like a Matthew Brady, you know, famous Civil War photographer, Matthew Brady, like the tin types or something like that, like once on Thursday of your trip, okay, the photographer is going to be here. He's coming in from wherever, El Paso, and he's going to take your photo if you want to. And it'd be a tin type. There's actually a guy on Instagram that's brought these back. I was I followed him a few years ago on Instagram where he does tin types, and he'll travel from town to town. And he uses like one of those classic cameras, and I think he might have even built like a new one. But it, it works the same, the emulsion technology and all that. Anyway, I love the idea <laughs> of, like, you'd stay in a western town, you know, for, for a week with, and live like that. So to be able to play a video game like that where you're out in the Old West and having to go on all these side missions to stop cattle rustlers and outlaws and, and, and all of that, I just, I had a blast playing Red Dead Redemption. And I love the music. The music was... The ambiance of this music was fantastic. I did a whole deep dive on the music in my other video. But switching when you when you got into a battle, switching from just like the, the ambiance of riding through with your horse and then suddenly now you're in a side quest battle and that 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 driving baseline kicks in and all of that. I, I loved it. I absolutely loved Red Dead Redemption, the first one. Of course everyone in the comments is like, wait till you play the second one. You gotta play the second one. I've heard some different things about the second one. Like you have to constantly be cleaning your gun. You have to worry about shaving and things like that. I don't know that I care for that kind of stuff, but I really loved, I really enjoyed the first one and I'm not done with it yet. In fact, there's still, I, I finished it. I, I, I did complete the game. I completed the whole story, the main story, but there's a bunch of side quests that I, I didn't do. So I'd like to go back to that. Plus the disc, the cartridge comes with, uh, on the Switch, it comes with Undead Nightmare, which is the zombie, I don't know if it was a DLC, I guess it was a DLC, or I, I don't think, I guess it was a DLC, right? Anyway, it was like a, or a separate game, they treat it as a separate game in the menu, so, but you know, you're battling zombies in the Wild West, so I have to play that version too, I'll have to play that at some point, maybe at Halloween I'll play Undead Nightmare next year, but yeah, loved Red Dead Redemption, okay, Let's keep some walking. So this is actually an old Roman ruin. They're they're excavating this uh, these ruins here. An old Roman village. It's called it was called like the Moon the Moon House, I think, where they would come to do like prayer or something. It's right on the cliffside here, overlooking the ocean. It's pretty cool. They've been working on these renovations or this this excavation now for for years. I don't know when they're going to be done. It's taking them forever. Here's just an old foundation of a house that sits up here on the top of this cliff. Right, 200 years old, 150 years old. 
I love thinking about who, who lived here in this space that long ago and had this view of this, this ocean here back when you know, no one else lived around here. Just goes to show you how fleeting, fleeting life is, you know, and how just to enjoy it, right? Enjoy your life. Don't get bogged down by stress because we're all gonna be, we're all gonna be gone someday, right? It's like, that's why I love, you know, it's like I work hard, but being able to take a break and play some games and read a book, play chess with my kids, you know, what else is there, right? I get so fascinated looking at old photos, especially from the old West, you know, black and white photos from the Civil War and things like that. I know I'm kind of macabre in that way. I'd go to like cemeteries. We had a we had a place up in the mountains of Pennsylvania, near Hawley, Pennsylvania. And there's an old cemetery up there, and I used to like to just go and just sit and sort of contemplate and think because you think all of these people, like all of the fears and anxieties they had in life, it's all gone, right? And their spirit is wherever it is now, and it's not worth it. You know, it's just not worth being stressed and worried about things. And uh, but I just love looking at like those old photos and I think, you know, if you can see worry in their eyes, right? You look at like 1800s photos and you see them where they have to stand still for 10 minutes to take a photo, you know? And uh, you just think whatever they're sort of worried about, it, of course it meant something to them at the time, but now that person's gone, right? And any kind of worry that they might have had doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter at all. Another game I missed back when it came out on the GameCube originally was Pri uh, Metroid Prime. So when they announced when Nintendo earlier this year Shadow Drop Metroid Prime Remastered, I thought I've got to jump on that. Certainly I did. Yeah, I, I was a huge Metroid fan. Metroid was the first game I ever beat on the NES, the original Metroid. Such a sense of accomplishment beating that game. And think back in the day where there's no internet. All I had was my Nintendo Player's Guide that came with my NES. I was one of those people that didn't get Mario Brothers or Duck Hunt or any of that. I got the Player's Guide, which I loved. I took it to school and I studied the maps and all of that. And the, the problem was with the maps, though, they only gave you, like, the first few... I think I think in that one, they only gave you, like, the first few levels in Metroid on the maps for that, in the player's guide. But it was really a sense of accomplishment to beat Metroid. And I never played the first-person shooter Metroid. Uh, huge Again, huge Metroid fan. And I had just beaten Metroid Dread last year. So I was excited to dive into Metroid Prime Remastered, and I gotta say, oh, just an unbelievable experience. The ambiance, the music, being in the friend, uh, is it Friendria, am I saying that right? Friendria Drifts and the snow scenes and that music, I could listen to that music and be in that environment it was just gorgeous. Fighting these enemies and of course, it was frustrating as hell because you're like, wait a minute, was I already here? I don't know if I was here. There's no breadcrumbs to let me know that I was here. I've got to try to remember, did I come through this door before? Now I've got to go back over here again. I've got to come back and forth and back and forth and I've got to go into the lava and out of the lava. And... But at the end of the day, managed to pull it off, managed to beat the game, complete that game. And I didn't, I don't think I 100%ed it. There was still some missile missile upgrades that I missed and things like that. I think there were some energy energy things that I missed as well. But some of those enemies, holy smokes, were they difficult <laughs> in true Metroid fashion. But now my son is playing it. Um, we just got a copy for my nephew for his birthday, his 12th birthday. And I had already, and I, I told my son, I said, buddy, I got you a copy of this. Are you, you're gonna borrow my copy and you're gonna play this along with your nephew. He's like, okay. So he started, he just started playing it now and he's really enjoying it. So he's just on the first few levels right now and just getting started. So he's got to have this experience as well. But yeah, Metroid Prime Remastered, another game that I completed this year. And what a, what an absolute treat that game was. I'm really hoping, well, I, you know, I, I haven't played Metroid Prime Echoes. I haven't played the other Metroid 
Prime games either. So that's something I'd like to try to do before Metroid Prime 4 comes out, whenever that comes out, which could be 2030 <laughs> at this point. But yeah, if I could play all of them, the whole trilogy, um, I think I'm gonna do that. I've got them on the Wii. I have the trilogy on the Wii in a, in a steel book that I got a couple of years ago. So might have to crack that open and play two and three before Metroid Prime 4 comes out. Of those, I mean, obviously Metroid Prime 1, the, the first one is a classic. Among the other two, what do you guys like? Do you like two or three better? Um, or do you like do you like it better than one? I'd, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Started off at about 50 degrees, and I think it's up to about 60 degrees. Another game I finished this year, I was trying to think back if there's any that I missed. I think the last one, I think, the last one that I played and beat over the summer, I actually played it right before Red Dead Redemption came out, is Shantae, the very first Shantae game. Uh, the Game Boy Advanced version that was released for the Nintendo Switch. I think it was a limited run, special edition uh, Switch package. So I played the original Game Boy Advance version that they released on the Switch, my first Shantae game. And again, I did a whole video on how much I love this game. I didn't know what to expect. I'd heard about Shantae sort of a little bit, but it was never it was never a game that I owned. It was never a game that I played. Any of the Shantae games. And just had a blast playing it. Love that you would use her ponytail to whip enemies and, and all of that. And, uh, uh, the music I thought was fantastic. I, I loved the combat. Um, I, I, you know, I really loved being able to turn into different things. The, the uh, turn into a bat. No, turn into a bat? Was it a bat or a bird? No, I guess it was a, a bird. Turn into a, an elephant, smash things, turn into a monkey and all of that. Um, just a ton of fun uh, to be able to do those different things. And again, real Metroidvania style, back and forth and back and forth. All right, just back from my walk. I'm trying to get back on eating no carbs and, and all of that and making sure that I'm eating protein. That's where the weight falls right off for me and I feel amazing. It's like I find myself slipping away from it and I start eating bread again and then, so I'm gonna have some hard boiled eggs for lunch and some, some cheese. So I'm just gonna boil up some water. That'll be my lunch. Just gotta, gotta stick to that. Just gotta stick to the protein from now on. While that water is boiling, I had to think about, I had to think about the other games that I that I played this year. So I had to run up to my collection real quick to look. And there are a few that I forgot that I played that I absolutely loved. I'm fortunate in that I spent 15 years really not playing a lot of games at all. So, you know, there's a website called Metacritic, of course, that emerged in that time. There's also a lot of great commentary and reviews of different games that I've always heard about over the years. So there's a lot of games that I never played. And so I'm fortunate in that I don't play a lot of crappy games because I've heard great things about so many of these games over the years, like Metroid Prime Remaster, Re Metroid Prime, right? You don't remaster a crappy game. So I'm lucky I didn't play a lot of crappy games this year at all. I think the only crappy game that I played this year was Loop 8. I really hated that game. I thought it had everything going for it. I love the name. I love the idea of the game. On paper, it sounded great. It was just garbage. I just, I hated it. Uh, but another game I completed this year, I, I think I have like three more games that I completed this year. Uh, Pikmin 4. Loved Pikmin 4. I'd never played a Pikmin game before. So I started with number four. <laughs> Uh, and then they announced there they released one and two on one cartridge, so I bought those, and I also bought Pikmin 3 Deluxe. So I've got all the Pikmin games now on the Nintendo Switch, which is really cool. I love having that whole collection on one on one system. But I loved Pikmin 4. 
I love the strategy. Uh, I love the music. I love the the combat. I, I really did. I love the strategy of having to figure out how to navigate these little backyard, you know, areas, these gardens, and all of that. Having to rescue certain individuals, and and I loved completing each level. So every level, I wanted a one hundred percent each level. I couldn't move on until I'd gotten a one hundred percent. So. You know, you could move on to the next worlds at like 70%, 80%. No, 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 no. It was 100% for me. And I loved Ochi, the dog. I loved I, I loved experiencing Pikmin 4. I thought that was a just a charming game. And it was real zen, too. It, was, it wasn't stressful. I didn't feel like it was a, a stressful thing. I could play it before bed for like an hour and just really enjoyed kind of exploring, um, leveling up the dog. Uh, getting stronger abilities and all of that, and and, uh, and and yeah, and finding different sections. So I could, if I was at 50% before bed, I could get to like 60% by the time I went to bed. And I felt a you know nice little sense of accomplishment. But I love the world. I love the idea of being a tiny little creature, tiny little Pikmin, and all of that in this backyard. Uh, I was a, I did landscaping for a lot of years of my life. I used to mow lawns for a living. And uh, so I loved you know, just being in the backyard and with the with the different irrigation system and, and, and all of that, the different plant life and everything. So uh, that was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun playing Pikmin 4. That's another game that I completed this year and had, I can't wait to go back and play one, two, three, and one, two, and three now. All right, some cheese, eggs, and some hot sauce. Lunch of champions. Yeah, so I had to come up to the gaming room to figure out the last the last two, because I was, I was like, I'm, I know I'm missing something here. And sure enough, second to last was Armored Core uh, 6, Fires of Rubicon. Now, I'd never played an Armored Core game before. I know. I know, blasphemous, right? But I love mechs. And I don't know how I missed playing the Armored Core games. Just none of my friends played it. I didn't know about it. It wasn't something that I owned. So I had heard that Armored Core 6 would be a game that you could just jump into, that you didn't need to have a lot of experience with the previous games. You could just experience it. You, you could just jump right in, learn the mechanics, uh, learn the lore, and get right into it. And that was my experience. I loved this game. Man, some of the bosses, I did again a, a whole video on the sea spider and battling that guy, which took me days upon days to beat that boss easily, easily some of the hardest bosses I've ever played in any game ever. But uh, of course, it's from software. From software is known for its incredibly difficult enemies or bosses. But then when you get through it, you feel such a sense of accomplishment. You feel like, oh my gosh, like I just won an award. But the the mechanics of leveling up your mech um, and I really did, I, I fully maxed out my mech. I did every possible uh, upgrade I could do. Um, and I beat this game. And it was a really, it was an amazing sense of accomplishment beating this game because it was so tough. But I just absolutely loved Armored Core. Maybe you want to, you know, think about, well, maybe I'll go back and play some of the previous ones. But maybe not, because I feel like, to me, like how beautiful this game is, the ambiance of this game, um, just the, the, the PlayStation 5, the speed, the processing power, being able to shoot and fire and stagger your enemies and play online with your friends. I played online with a friend of mine. We played for hours and hours. Uh, we had like 50, 50 battles back and forth. Um, I think he won like 26th of them or something. I won 24 or I don't know. He, I think he ended up beating me overall, but anyway, I love this. So I don't know that I need to go back and play any of the previous ones because to me, this seems like the culmination of this this kind of tech, you know? And I think I might be troubled if I went back and played a previous Armored Core and found it to be sluggish and, I don't know, maybe not as enjoyable. But who knows? I'll, I'll give it a try. One of my favorite games I played this year was Assault Suits Valken and love this game. It was an original, you know, uh, an SNES game. They brought it to the Nintendo Switch they just announced a physical version of it, and I love that, you know, side-scrolling uh, shoot shooter, but it's uh, mechs, you know, so, and, you know, that's old school, so antiquity of the mechs, so maybe I would, maybe I would like some old Armored Core 
Let me know if you're an Armored Core fan. Drop me a comment below. And uh, are there any worth going back and trying out now that I've played Armored Core 6 and I beat it? Um, and what a, yeah, just a great feeling, especially being able to beat the Sea Spider. Oh my gosh, what? <laughs> that was the toughest. Again, I did a whole video on the Sea Spider. Uh, go check it out. Um, it was hilarious. It was really, really funny. And finally, so my final game, I had so much fun playing this game this year with my son. Now, it didn't come out this year, but that is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge. And my son and I have been doing beat em up beat em ups nights. beat em up nights? beat em up yeah, beat em ups nights. So on the weekend, we'll get together on a Friday or Saturday night. We'll play a few beat em ups for a few hours. And this was one that we, we absolutely loved, Shredder's Revenge. It had all of the hallmark classic Turtles sounds and moves and tropes and picking up the pizza and all the little funny asides and the gameplay. Um, the pixel art looks amazing. Um, the enemies look amazing. The story is fantastic. It is such a love letter to those original Turtles games that I played in the arcade, you know? And it was so great to be able to play with my son. Even my nephew popped in at one point. My daughter popped in. We had a whole team of four people playing. My daughter played with April. She was smashing people over the head uh, with the microphone <laughs> as the reporter. Um, I, I always end up uh, taking like Michelangelo. Um, my son uh, took Donatello. And so just a ton of fun. So we beat the main game. We beat Shredder. We beat the main game. And then, of course, they just announced the new DLC as well. So uh, I'm waiting to buy the physical of that. Uh, I think I have it on order right now to play the physical uh, and the DLC of the complete, the ultimate edition. So it has this entire new DLC. So there you go. Those are the games that I played in 2023 and completed. There are a bunch of other games I played, but these are the ones I completed this year. What a year. What a year for games. Holy smokes. Really, really was. And of course, I've got an entire backlog. <laughs> of games over here with PlayStation 5. I've got a nice uh, sizable uh, backlog of, of of Switch games. I've got uh, I've got some classics over here that I still have yet to play. So I've got a good a lot of games to play in 2024. I'm excited about that. So what about you guys? Tell me in the comments uh, how many of these games you completed, how many of these games you played. What was your favorite game of the year? And uh, drop me a comment below, guys. Um, yeah, I got more games to play. I got to go finish Tears of the Kingdom right now. I've got four shrines left. So have a great one.